So we are talking today about the cosmic microwave background. So um, I've prepared for you um, uh, a few historical remarks concerning this important uh, tracer. It is one of the most fundamental signals that we have from the early universe in cosmology uh, today. So this picture is showing a, a kid, uh, a three years old in Odessa in uh, Ukraine, and uh, his name is uh, George Gamov. And um, at the time, immediately after the Second World War, this guy here was leading a group of scientists uh, investigating the role of uh, investigating the nuclear uh, physics uh, with the, you know, the ambition of understanding nuclear processes and eventually these studies <clears throat> conducted everybody to have uh, uh, nuclear bombs as well. So he was, he was a, a, a smart scientist and he was uh, interested to, ma to many, many topics. And uh, in particular, he was interested to these new ideas in astrophysics and cosmology and he started to think about these funny ideas of the universe which is expanding. And he came out with a very simple reasoning. He said, if the, us the universe is expanding and I, I am able to reverse the time, there was a time in the, early, in, uh, in, in the remote past in which the universe was probably very dense. So he said, the conclusion was, uh, was that uh, if uh, the universe is really expanding, then there was a time in which there were lot, lots of thermonuclear explosions everywhere in the universe. Okay, and this simple reasoning uh, led to one of the most important predictions in, in modern physics. So he said, calculated this, uh, the abundance of all this radiation, you know, the gamma radiation produced by thermonuclear, thermonuclear explosions, and he said, he cannot be disappeared today must be diluted, must be, must be very weak, rarefied, etc., etc., but it must be still be present in, in space. Okay, and um, he did the calculation, and the calculation showed at the time with the precision, he made a prediction of this uh, 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 radiation, saying that uh, it should be still present today, very, very weak and diluted in space, and with a characteristic quantity to be associated to this radiation, which is the temperature. He said it's probably 25 degrees above the, the absolute zero. Okay. Now, today we know that uh, this radiation is actually three degrees uh, above zero. It has been discovered, and uh, no, the prediction is actually uh, incredibly spectacular. About 20 years after, these two persons, Penzias and Wilson, uh, were two technicians in the Bell Laboratories in the US, and they were testing uh, communication for satellites. They, they had to deliver this antenna, and um, they basically built the antenna and discovered that the antenna was uh, malfunctioning. So it was measured incorrectly, everything seemed okay, but uh, there was a little disturbance in the measured radiation from the sky, okay. which was, which was uh, pretty tricky because uh, it appeared to be very uniform in the sky. So they tried to turn the antenna in different directions in order to get rid of the disturbance, but they weren't able to, to get rid of it. So they interpret this uh, occurrence in terms of a, a dirt in the antenna. So they clean the antenna, but the disturbance was still there persisting. And at that point, they made something which is characterizing them scientists. You know, they were pressured by their boss to deliver the antenna anyway because the malfunction was really small. Okay. But they decided to be curious and they started to take data and they were in front of one of the most amazing discoveries of, of all times. So they started to write what they were measuring on papers, and their data came to the attention of the nearby Princeton Institute, where cosmologists like, like Dickey and Peebles and others were actually thinking to build an antenna to detect the radiation 
the Rayleigh radiation in the universe as predicted by George, by George Gamow in the case in which the universe was expanding. Uh, Pentiens and Wilson received the, the Nobel Prize for Physics. All right, so we need to fix our ideas and uh, given the discovery to try to understand what is this radiation actually doing in the sky. Well, the analogy is, is very simple here and uh, essentially contained in this uh, little picture. You see a man here looking at the sky and looking at the clouds. Of course, you, you, don't, you don't see the interior of the clouds. You see the surface of the clouds. Because in the interior of the clouds, the density and the interactions are, do not allow to the light to come out of the clouds. So you see the surface of the clouds. And on top of that, you are able to see the structure of the surface of the clouds. You see a, a cloud which is denser here, less dense there, etc., etc., in their surface. You see structure. Well, with the universe, it's basically uh, the same thing. So there was a time close to the Big Bang, 380,000 years uh, after the Big Bang at earlier times, in which the, the temperature and density was so high for, to prevent the light to move freely. So we say te technically that uh, the mean free path for photons at that time was much smaller than the size of the universe, which we call horizon. Then there was a time in which, since the, the universe was expanding and the temperature was uh, uh, decreasing, there was a time in which this, um, the mean free path for photons was about equal to the size of the universe. We call this uh, epoch decoupling because from that point on, the photons do not interact anymore with the rest of the system. We are about here. From that point onward, the universe becomes transparent and the light comes directly to us. So we see the clouds of the universe where those clouds are, is the surface of the gas at the temperature of the universe at 380 thousand years after the Big Bang. The point is that uh, uh, with clouds we can look, we can see, we can see uh, density and other properties. With the equivalent in the universe, we see interesting things. Oh, and actually we can see how the universe was made, what was its composition and the distribution of density at the earliest epoch we can access via electromagnetic radiation. Okay. And so this is spectacular research, being able to actually recognize those and measure those clouds is actually uh, one of the research lines which started in the 60s, right after the discovery of the cosmic microwave background and still continues. So lots of efforts was, was actually immediately dedicated to, the, to actually being able to map the surface of the clouds of the early universe. And the first discovery of, a of those structures, because they were very, very tiny, came in the, in the late 80s, the, the Cosmic Background Explorer, in which a satellite was put orbiting Earth and measured, provided two most important measurements. One is the distribution in, frame, in energy of the cosmic microwave background, reproducing what we in physics is called a black body, okay, with a temperature which is 2.7 Kelvin with extreme precision. But the second measurement was the first, which is the subject of this lecture, was the first image here of those clouds in the early universe, precisely those that uh, we see here in the, in the picture. So those, no, you see that in this respect, uh, those clouds mapped on the entire sphere are very big. And you may wonder if they are so big because they are really so big or because the instrument was only able to resolve 
big clouds. Okay. So immediately after the discovery, a big effort started to build uh, machines which were able to actually resolve these clouds much better in their detail. And uh, uh, I'm reporting here only the other two spaceships which were, were dedicated to this mapping. The, the Wilkinson Microwave Anisotropy Probe by NASA and the Planck Satellite, the last mission, which, which is from the European Space Agency. An idea of the effort in these things, uh, we are images of the launch, images of the first detach, detach from the spaceship in, in orbit, and then a picture of the satellite, the Planck satellite, orbiting uh, around uh, in, a, in a position which is beyond the moon in order to decrease all disturbances to, to measurements. Okay. It uh, was launched in, in, in 2009, and uh, the data analysis has been in process since then and still continues. Okay? And many, many papers, uh, scientific papers, are impacting not only cosmology, but also many areas of particle physics and, uh, and astrophysics. And here, you know, the level of details in which we are now. So imagine the progress from this image mapping the surface of, of the clouds in the early universe, just like we look at the clouds in the sky, now the same can be done with the microwave radiation in the, uh, for the early universe. From this level of detail, we are now here. You can also see that uh, some of the gross features, like this, uh, this red area here, is actually also in the first image. This blue area here is also in the newest, because this is the same picture as was taken by Kobe, just with, with incredibly higher accuracy and angular resolution. And cosmologists, we do now a little bit quantitative analysis of this image. So cosmologists and, and physicists in general are inspecting this image and uh, characterizing each single feature, the distribution of the, of the uh, dense regions versus the underdense regions, and any, any possible uh, detail about this image. And here comes a little extension. In addition to being um, mapping the intensity of radiation from all possible directions, the modern instruments are actually able to catch another property of the light coming from these early epochs, the so-called polarization. So photons, electromagnetic light is polarized, and it is um, usually the polariz polarization is indicated as a little vector, the direction of the polarization, which is given here in this image, which is still from Planck, and maps the intensity of the polarized signal in all directions, and the direction of the polarization vector in all directions. The polarization, because it's a richer carrier of information. So how do we do that in a little bit more quantitative way? Well, we basically do uh, a sort of Fourier expansion of these images. And we put the equivalent of the Fourier wave vector in the y-axis and the power in the, uh, in the, in the, the x-axis and the power in the y-axis. And we see that the Fourier transform of these images produces these curves, which, are, which we now define. So we see lots of features here. We see four curves. We see one part of the feature with curve which is very regular, which is other which are bumping and oscillating. So we want to understand this. So everything was in thermal equilibrium or close to a thermal, equi thermal equilibrium. And uh, with the, in these conditions, and, that, and the energy density, the energy at which we describe the system, was about 
the, one, the temperature of the universe 380,000 years after the Big Bang, which is uh, not particularly high. It is the temperature of uh, outer regions of a star, so it's about 3,000 Kelvin. So at that energies, we know the physics. If you think about just about six times the temperature that you may have in the oven in your, in your home. So at this time, in these conditions, we write Boltzmann equations, in which the evolution of the population of photons and, uh, and other particles of the standard model are just uh, modified by what? By the forces which are active at the time, which are gravity and electromagnetic scattering. Okay. Then you go in the less known components of the systems, which are neutrinos, but they also have an abundance, which may be described by, is modified by gravitational, by gravity, and by weak interactions. And the mysterious part among the cosmological ingredients, which is the dark matter, which is interacting certainly with gravity, with the rest of the system, plus possibly weak interaction at most, because it relates gravity to the sum of, of the effects, the gravitational effects, from all the components that we just treated. Okay. So this makes a circular systems, Boltzmann equations versus Einstein equations. You can put your initial conditions there and play with equations, getting your final conditions, final, final state of your, of your final predictions for your system, compare compared that with observations, and say if the system is, is, your hypotheses are okay or not. And this is more or less the game of cosmology today. So let's, uh, let's inspect gravity first. So gravity, uh, Einstein, Einstein's gravity is, is a very, very uh, fascinating theory interprets gravity in a geometrical way. And uh, no, you can show that in cosmology, where gravitational perturbations are small with respect to the background ones, general relativity allows you to have three modes of fluctuations. The first ones are populating the metric tensor everywhere equally, and they are called scalar perturbations. They are associated to scalar gravity, Newtonian, the equivalent of Newtonian gravity like gravitational infall, for example. The second family of perturbations is made by the so-called vorticity, so associated to velocity. So it can have um, components only in the um, space-space part of the metric or time-space part of the metric. And um, general relativity leaves you with uh, a, third, a third mode of oscillations, which is represented by cosmological gravitational waves which are, which are there. Let's see the other force which is acting, the electromagnetic scattering. Well, in this context, we have to, to, to focus on some of its processes. First of all, it is a fantastic um, carrier of information because the Thomson scattering is able to transform and initially anisotropic and unpolarized radiation into an outgoing linearly polarized waves represented in this sketch. So if uh, this is your instrument, we are, it's us today observing the radiation coming from the clouds or in the early universe around us, then the last emitter, the, the electron which last scattered the photon that we are looking, if it was um, in, um, surrounded by anisotropic radiation, it was able to, pol to emit a linear polarization wave coming towards us. So not only we record flux coming from all directions, but also the polarization. So let's, let's dig a little bit more into this scheme. So this is a picture, again, the observation is here and this is representing the surface from which we see the sky. So photons coming from different directions may be um, associated to regions which were different. These regions were uh, affected by, by waves in the, by, of perturbations in the early universe. 
and some of them, some photos may come for a hill in the, of, of perturbations in the early universe, some other from a well in the perturbations. And of course, of course the universe, it is colder here and hotter there. So different. And the universe, of course, have, uh, pertur has perturbations in all wavelengths. And so I record, by recording these numbers, these fluxes coming from all directions, I reconstruct the distribution of the gas initially. And it gives you the, the famous picture here. On the other hand, so this is spectacular, but on the other hand, it is giving you, uh, it is not able, it is just a number, it's a scalar quantity, so it just sums up the effect from all kinds of cosmological perturbations doesn't help you in distinguishing between scalars, vectors, and tensors. What about polarization then? Well, polarization is a much richer quantity. It's a rank two tensors. So in addition to its amplitude, you get also this Stokes parameters Q and U. And so cosmologists were immediately very smart and they said, Oh, well, I can combine these components, Q and U, to actually decompose the polarization fields into two components. One is the gradient, so scalar type, called E. And this is also summing up and not helping you in recognizing the effect of one particular perturbation mode. So sums up scalar, vectors, and tensor. And whatever is left, the curl component, called B modes of cosmological perturbations of, of CMB anisotropies, which is excited only if there are non-scalar modes in the metric. Okay? So these, uh, if the B modes in, 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 these, uh, in the polarization distribution in the sky is actually measured, that it means that there is no scalar mode in the metric. And since uh, vectors are not supported, we cannot demonstrate it here, but, uh, but uh, we, can, we, can, we can state that vectors are not supported by the cosmological expansion. If the B-mode component in the polarization of these anisotropies around us should be discovered, then it would be a, a very, very strong evidence for the existence of cosmological gravitational waves. And lots, so, Basically, all the research con concerning CMB in, uh, in, this, uh, in this epoch is, is directed to targets this component of the CMB polarization. Okay. How you treat this system? Well, uh, your maps are the observables, T, Q, U, etc. And you basically uh, transform them into spherical harmonics by finding your equivalent ALMs, which are the expansion amplitude into spherical harmonics of these maps. Then you isolate, you build your, your um, total intensity and uh, the two modes of polarization, already decomposed, uh, the Q and U mapped into E and B, and, um, and you do your um, summation over one of the multiple in order to find the so-called power spectra. This are the ones which are plotted here. You see the CLs. And four of them, because there are four components in, in the, in the, in the uh, coupling between, in, while these, these X and Y, four non-zero components, X and Y, are varied between T, E, and B. Okay, and so the, these are the quantities are, which are plotted there. And uh, we may already start to reason about the features of this plot here, there is a clear different in the behavior. Curves are more regular on this part than and they are bubbly on the other part. So there is clearly physics, some physics going on here and some other going on here. So on, uh, the reason is that uh, on these uh, uh, multiples, I'm looking at very large angles. Angles which correspond to regions which didn't, didn't interact with each other at the time in which the, the image was taken. While on the other part, no, the angles I'm looking are smaller and are, correspond to regions which did interact in the past. 
So we call these regions uh, primordial power here in the total intensity. The black curve here represents total intensity is the CL TT, okay, the power spectrum of temperature or total intensity and isotropies. So on the, on, the large, on the scales in which there was no interaction yet when the picture was taken, then you have essentially a mapping of the primordial power, which is pretty regular in, in the angular domain. In the other part, instead, the different constituents had time to, to interact, and they were basically featuring acoustic oscillations that you see here, and we call precisely acoustic oscillations. The uh, other curves are all related to polarization. The biggest one is the magenta. And you see that the peaks are in phase, for all of them, in phase with the ones in total intensity. The magenta is for x equal to t and y equal to e, the cross correlation between, between total intensity and gradient polarization. The blue curve is for, the, uh, the for uh, EE, the ALME times AL, ALME in the, in the spectrum. So the E, the blue curve is representing the so-called auto spectrum of the E modes, where well, X and Y are equal to E, and also has a regular part and acoustic oscillations. And then there is this, re, this red part here, which is the CLBB, the power spectrum of the curl component in the, in the perturbations. And I'm claiming here that uh, the primordial gravitational waves contribute only in one single part of the spectrum, which is the one at, at 100. We now check why. Well, it's very simple to, to understand. So the B modes, record cosmological gravitational waves at a single uh, multiple, about 100, correspond to about two degrees in the sky. Why? Because the gravitational waves are not supported by anything when they start to interact with the rest of the system. They don't collide with any, any other particle. So they, on smaller angles, they are rapidly diffused, like uh, photons by free light. On the other time, since the time for, uh, for the photons to decouple and heat the last scattered, in the last scattering regions, is, uh, corresponds to the, to, the tick, to the amount of time which uh, the system took to decouple, then the, there is no time for photons coming from very far away to heat large scattered. So I don't have any, any power on larger scales. So these two limits set a contribution which is really visible only at one angle. And that one angle is basically one degree in the sky. That is where experiments are now targeting the signal and trying to, to focus. So you see that uh, together with this, there are other parts of the, of the curves which we didn't treat. So those, those regions, those parts are activated by the so-called last scattering effects on the cosmic microwave background. Essentially, the photons, when they come to us, they do not come on unperturbed, but they actually cross forming cosmological structures. So we now briefly mention, without going into the details, what cosmolog forming cosmological structures do to those photons. And there are basically two effects. Either they, they encounter some free particles, if free particles are freed again by the, the uh, turning on of the lights in the universe, as it is the case, or they interact gravitationally. And uh, this, uh, <coughs> more specifically, these two terms are called reionization because you know, when the light uh, are turning on, on here because of the first luminous objects, the ultraviolet radiation from those are basically hitting the neutral gas and free electrons again. So there is a rescattering here. And gravitation is basically dynamics in the metric. The universe is expanding. New cosmological expansion regimes are coming in. So the metric tension is evolving. This makes an effect. 
and also gravitational lensing deflection, which is which is uh, no, occurs because occasionally photons are passing by over densities which um, uh, deflect the radiation. We focus uh, on this effect and just say a few words to understand it's spectacular. This is an area of research today. It's called a, it's, it's called a CMB and body lensing, CMB lensing. So the photons coming from the last scattering surface are passing through forming cosmological structures and they are deflected by those. So we'll never see the CMB, the, the anisotropy, as it is in reality. I mean, we'll see that blurred by this gravitational lensing. And uh, it's uh, really uh, quick to, to comment what the gravitational lensing does to those structures. So photons which are coming on wrong directions with respect to observations are deflected into our observations. And, uh, and this makes the blurring of the total intensity anisotropy T. For, for the polarization, another effect comes your beautiful decomposition between the gradient mode of the polarization and the curl mode of the polarization is not valid anymore. And therefore, uh, the E and B mix with each other. And so something which was all, only E in the beginning leaks into, into the B power here, which is represented by this, by this cartoon. The relevance of C and B lensing is not only a disturbance, it's not only a blurring, a disturb to the original radiation, but this happens when the universe starts to accelerate the expansion. So there is huge research on C and B lensing because it is a fact which coincides in the epoch, which, is, which starts to be relevant in the epoch in which the universe acceleration sets. And so the observing C and B lensing is like observing the universe at the time in which the acceleration started. And we are able to isolate, uh, to complete the picture that you see here with all the physical processes which are, which are active. Primordial power here, the, the red circles are the ones, the effects on the cosmic microwave background active at the time in which it was, it was born. So primordial power here, acoustic oscillations there, and cosmological gravitational waves. The blue curves are instead the so-called secondary effects, changing the metric tensor, which makes <coughs> a change into the, into the universe at large scales, including the total intensity perturbations, the rescattering from cosmic radiation, which boosts all the signals for polarizations up again, as you see here, and the gravitational lensing, in which you see that uh, the, this peak in the B modes is completely due to the leak of polarization power into, from E to B. So this is the picture, the physical content of the cosmic microwave background anisotropies in all its observables, these four power spectra there, and in relation to the physical processes which activated uh, those uh, that, uh, and, uh, that we just uh, discussed. Very active research lines concern the search for cosmological gravitational waves Okay, which would open an unprecedented window into the physics of the early universe, which would demonstrate the existence of cosmological gravitational waves, and the C and B lensing, which is, which is uh, allowing us to, in, in, to inspect, to have insight into the dark universe. So the dark matter uh, effects on the C and B through gravitational deflection, and the behavior of the dark energy and the expansion. <laughs>